All right. Uh, hopefully you are, you're, you're looking for how to crack the code to the hottest real estate markets in 2023. If, if you're looking for that, you're in the right place. We're going to let everybody fill into the room. I'm uh, not really your host. I'm going to be, uh, I'm just going to be the MC for this one because I brought my good friend, Neil Bawa here. Neil, how are you doing? Fantastic. So good to be back on with Anderson and with you, Toby. Yeah, well, I always love your, like, we've done a bunch of podcasts, we've been working together for years, I don't even know how many years. I like the way Neil does data, uh, because there's so much garbage that gets spewed in the news, and everybody's trying to whip you with this way, whip you that way. I like people that actually talk about facts, and so uh, uh, this is... A fun event for me. I like to sit back and uh, and listen to everything Neil's going over, and he's going to give you a bunch of tools so that uh, everything that he's talking about today uh, that you can implement right away and become a better investor. So, uh, Neil, I want to get out of your hair and just let you jump right on in because I know we got a couple hours, and uh, I imagine that you have probably about three hours worth of material <laughs> that we're going to cram into that couple hours Which, yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna squish that into the next two hours so welcome everyone and thank you toby thank you anderson um so i'll start off with a, a little bit about myself so when i was nine years old i was di diagnosed with with autism and um it was because i would pay too much attention to numbers and not enough attention to people um, and was very quiet, very withdrawn. And uh, my my um, my dad was a fighter pilot. He died in the 1971 war with with Pakistan. I was a I was a baby. I was a few weeks old. And so I we had access to the best army and and air force hospitals in in India. And so they took me there. And luckily, I found a good psychologist who fixed my head. Uh, but they they developed my gift for numbers. So uh, if you remember from the Matrix, right? Neo, all he saw was numbers. He he saw. The, those green numbers falling and it allowed him to read the world around him. Um, I'm a little bit like that. I, everything to me is numbers. When I'm walking in the morning, I'm counting the steps uh, when I'm walking uh, you know, back and forth. Um, when I'm looking at clouds, I'm wondering what is the, you know, the number of feet from the ground to the cloud. To me, I, I see the world in numbers and it's, it's fascinating that when you see the world that way and you measure the world that way, you reach some startling conclusions. So, um, you know, my story is tied back to these numbers and the, the, the content that I'm going to present to you today is tied back to these numbers. The first thing that I'm going to present to you is something called Location Magic. And, and it is the most popular real estate course on Udemy.com. Udemy is a website that has hundreds of thousands of courses and, you know, has hundreds of millions of people that have taken courses at Udemy.com, U-D-E-M-Y.com. This is the most popular real estate course on Udemy. Um, currently, I think I have 12 and a half thousand students. Um, there's a thousand five-star reviews. It's actually the most highly rated course there. And... And I, I'm stunned at how many people love this course. I, I, it's because, you know, it, maybe it's because I made it less dense, right? But it is really about the data science of real estate. It's about how anyone who knows nothing about real estate, you don't know the first thing about real estate, but you, by taking this course, which is, you know, I'm going to deliver it to you today in an hour, you can then go and look at any city in the United States, no matter how big, no matter how small, it could be a, a city of 10,000 people, it could be a city of 10 million people, and compare them for real estate future profits. That's the only thing you're looking to do. I want to compare these cities for future real estate profits. And I want to be able to do that without any, any prerequisite, without any knowledge. I've never flipped a home. I've never bought a rental. That's, that's my goal. And this goal came out of this obsession that I had in the 2008, 2009 timeframe. Um, you know, I, I was, I was a technologist. I had 400 people reporting to me and, um, and running a tech company and I was making a lot of money, but I was also giving a lot of money up. You know, this is what Anderson talks about. Toby talks about, it's not what you make, it's what you keep. And I, I started to realize that because I, I live in Texafornia. So 53% of my income was going to the man, right? Either to the state or federal. And so I'm give, shoveling huge amounts of money over. And I'm saying, there's got to be a way to, to, to save this stuff, right? And so I got around the Taxifornia curse by starting to, to build real estate for my company. Not, not for myself. I was building it for my company, but I was a shareholder. So all of a sudden, I went from paying you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars in taxes each year to nothing. And that stunned me because I was like, am I doing something wrong? Is this shady? And then I looked into it and it was like, no, depreciation is completely legal. You can do this. So I, 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 I fell in love with real estate. But then I'm like, you know, I'm the math guy, right? I'm the numbers guy. So I'm like, hmm, what should I do next? 
well, I, I should, um, you know, the next logical thing obviously is that I should look at every city in the United States and I should profile them and figure out which ones are the most profitable, right? That's how I think. And so I'm like, well, how am I going to figure out uh, how many cities even there are in the United States? So I started to mine the Bureau of Labor Statistics website. It's bls.gov. And so I hired a Ukrainian hacker and they basically mined those. So I, I could figure out how many metros there are in the US. There's 323. Um, and, and how many people live in these metros? Well, which ones are big? Which ones are small? Which ones grow faster? Which ones grow slower, right? So the Ukrainian hacker, hacker helps me with that. And then I'm like, well, but that's just demographics data. I need to figure out data that is, um, that is uh, about uh, income and about you know um, real estate, right? Where's the real estate data? So it was like, oh, let me, let's go hack Zillow.com. So we basically hacked Zillow.com and Trulia.com and redfin.com and a bunch of those and we gather data into this database called R, right? This is only for the, the true nerds in here, right? There's a statistical analysis software, it's called R, right? Just the word letter R. And so you can stick data into it and it gives you insights and these it's gotten better and better over time. And these insights are like stuff that you wouldn't even think about, right? Like here's an insight. If a city has very high growth, very high growth, very high population growth, right? And very high crime reduction, then the quality of schools doesn't matter. And you'd say, no, no, the quality of schools always matters, Neil. The answer is not for rental real estate. It's when you're buying for yourself, it matters. But for rental real estate profits, it doesn't matter as long as the other three are right. That kind of insights comes out of this software. So me and the Ukrainian hacker were pounding all this stuff in there. And, and eventually we end up with a list of all the cities in the United States, big, small, you know, um, in every state in the US. And we, what we start doing then is we start looking at real estate prices, home prices. We start looking at, you know, uh, residential real estate. We, we're saying, how do I get all this data that I've collected together about these cities, their growth, their population, their income, their, you know, th their data. How do I correlate that to the profits, right? So we figured out how to do it. it. Took us about six months. We figured out the correlation. And then we were asking ourselves, asking the software this question, what creates real estate profit? What is the thing, the one thing that leads to the most amount of real estate profit consistently, right? Okay, fine. And we figured out the answer to that question. The answer was short-term jobs, right? So we looked at jobs over a 20-year time frame. Didn't work. Five years, didn't work. The only thing that worked, the highest correlation to real estate profits was 12-month job growth. So I was like, okay, so this is number one. What's number two? What's number three? What's number four? What's number five? So we, we kept churning the software and we kept coming up with things that were making a huge impact to, um, to real estate profits. And then what we would do is back testing. So we'd go back and look at the last 12 months of data for home prices in every city in the US from all the way from Orlando to Seattle, right? So East Coast to West Coast. And we basically say, okay, so we're making all these guesses, these, these you know hypo hypotheses. Are they really matching real life? Are people making huge amounts of money? And the answer was yes, it was working. It was like 96, 97% accurate. There were examples where it didn't work, especially in student housing towns. Our math wasn't working correctly because students have zero income and that was playing with all of our numbers. So we learned something there that our system doesn't work well in towns where like 40, 50% of the people are students because the system doesn't get the data right. It thinks that all these students have no income where, well, they're students. That's why they have no income. So we learned a bunch of things, right? And so I, I take this data and I'm like, I'm so excited about this. I'm like, let me sort it. So I sort it and, and this is 2009. I sort it and I'm like, what city in the United States creates the most amount of real estate profits or will create the most amount of real estate profits? Well, as it happened, it was Madeira, California. It was here in the in, in California. So we drive 140 miles um, to to Madeira, California, and, and it's mostly empty. The, 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 the city is mostly empty because Kaufman and Broad, you know, made a bunch of homes. They have four bedroom, beautiful homes um, and sold them to farm workers with no income verification, right? So obviously by 2009, those people were all gone. The, the homes were empty. And so I go to this broker and ask him, you know, what does it cost to build these homes? Oh, 250,000. What are you selling them for? Oh, 100,000. I'm like, how is that possible? Does this cost $250,000 to build and you're selling them for 100,000? That doesn't make any sense. Wouldn't that mean that in the future, the price would go up? He's like, of course, but nobody wants to buy them because you can't rent them. And I'm said, I'm like, why? Because there's thousands of them. They're all empty. So I said, okay. So if I could figure out a way to rent these these to people, that would make me instantly uh, cash flow like crazy, right? He said, yes. So I said, okay. I jump in my car and I drive another 20 miles to Fresno. Fresno is about the, the bigger city that's close to Madeira. And I go to a real estate agent and I basically say, I want to buy one old property in, in uh, Fresno. And he's like, no, no, no. I can sell you brand new ones. They're cheap. I said, no, I want to buy an old property. So we ended up buying a 1994 property on Summerfield Lane. And I basically 
told, as soon as I bought the property, I went back to the Ukrainian hacker and I said, I want you to publish a rental ad for this property in every place on the web. And I want you to use every hack you can, you know, clicking, scraping, whatever it is to generate huge numbers of leads for me. And he's like, why do you want so many leads? I mean, this is just one property, right? Don't you want like 10 leads? I said, no, I want thousands. And he's like, okay, fine. So he writes all these scripts that are basically clicking on our ad in all of these places and moving it up all to the top. So we're getting hundred times as many leads and all these leads are coming in. And I have this, you know, Filipino lady picking up the phone and the, and, and the, the, the lady's basically offering people gift cards to go to Madeira to see the property, right? Because Madeira is 20 miles away and most people hang up on us because they're like, no, 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 I want a property in Fresno. And we're like, yes, but we'll give you 50 bucks if you take, you know, $50 gift card, if you just simply go to Madeira and look at these brand new homes. And one out of 10 people wouldn't hang up on us. They would basically say, okay, this is fine. And they would drive to Madeira and fall in love with the property because those properties are much newer, much more beautiful. And before I knew it, I all of my properties were rented and I was buying them $100,000 each, renting them at $1,000. They're now almost $3,000 in rents. And I had learned something magical that this stuff actually works, right? Those properties have tripled, many of them have quadrupled in price. And so this worked. I was very excited. So I was like, I have to tell everybody on the planet about this stuff. I didn't, you know, at that point think internet. So I started to, um, decided to open a meetup group. Where? Inside my business. I'm running a technology business with 400 employees and I have these big conference rooms. And in the morning, I am running a tech company. And in the evening, I'm attending all these meetup groups. So I basically, because I don't have the time to, to fight San Francisco Bay Area traffic, I decide the meetup should be here. So I call all the meetup group organizers in the Bay Area and say, I have these beautiful conference rooms with projectors. Would you like to hold your meetup here? And they're like, yes. Are you, you, know, are you gonna charge us? No. And so I started learning about real estate by walking 150 feet from my corner office to my conference rooms. And, I, and there were a bunch of different kinds of meetups, but the one that resonated with me the most was multifamily because it was about scale and I was running a scaled company. And so I learned a lot there. But the first thing I did was I decided I'm gonna teach this stuff that I've learned to people. And the first time I, I taught it, I wrote a very long description of it and emailed it to people. And I'm thinking a hundred people are going to show up. Four people showed up, four people. And three of them were data scientists themselves from a company called Apple. And the third, fourth one were, was from a company called Google. And I'm like, why didn't anybody show up? I wrote such a huge, long description of my wonderful thing. And so one of those four guys said, that's because you think everyone in the world is like you. They're not data scientists. So write a different description the next time. And, and, and make this so simple that anyone can understand it in 10 minutes. The first time I taught it, it took me two hours just to explain it. Right. So and you needed to be a statistical analysis expert. So eventually, over two years, I basically watered it down, not watered down, but made it easier to use. And that's what you're going to see today. It's called Location Magic, and it's the first hour that I'm going to present today. So let's get started. All right. And I'm going to share my screen. And by the way, you're getting a more updated version than Udemy.com. So in case you're thinking, oh, I can just go take this at Udemy, the answer is no, that's eight months out of date and only gets updated once in a year. This is actually the most updated version, All right? So hey, your Neil, goal- Can I pop in real quick? Because I put your Udemy, the name of the course was uh, sure. the 2023 location. P people were asking since you mentioned sure. it. Sure, that's perfectly fine. I mean, hey, it's a great course. And, and it's actually a little different from what I'm going to present today. So it's a fantastic idea to take the course both ways because there you've got some exercises and other things that you can do. All right. So how, how do you find your hair, your hair? But I want to just say real quick, if you have a question posted in the Q&A, post it in the Q&A, you could chat to Neil, uh, but I doubt he'll see it, but you can ask questions. And then when we're done, I'll, I'll, I'll interrupt and we'll, we'll do some q and I'm out of your hair now. Sounds good. All right. So best cities in the US for real estate, right? And just a little bit about me today, right? I gave you my story. That was sort of my backstory. Um, I've, uh, in 2013, I've sold my company. And after selling it, I decided I'm gonna jump into real estate and take money from other people. Until that time, for six or seven years, it was just my personal money I was investing. And I, I was getting better and better. I was buying single family, then duplexes, then triplex, then quadplex, then sevenplex, then 14plex. So eventually I was like, you know, I'm just gonna buy a 200 unit building and take other people's money. That worked out really well. Um, we've now bought, you know, 4,800 units of multifamily and student housing in 10 states. Uh, and there's roughly a thousand investors with me. Actually, there's about 40 or 50 investors from Anderson that have invested in me. These are some of the properties that I've bought. Um, I've also built a bunch of properties. 
Um, so uh, here's here's some of the properties that I've built. I, I guess I should update these pictures. They're old. Now I have the, these are renderings, but they're, the real buildings exist in all but one of these cases. So it's been a lot of fun, a lot of math, but I'll get started. There's some reviews here, but I'm, I'm just going to skip these and go straight into uh, my um, disclaimer. We are not investment advisors. So, uh, this is an educational webinar. Investments involve different degrees of risk. I'm not going to talk about an investment today, but understand that just because you have location magic and it's magic doesn't mean that all of your investments will be successful. You still have to put work into them. Make sure that you are consulting a professional advisor before you invest uh, your money. All right. One of the key things that everyone today should know is that the United States has changed. There are roughly 18 million good families in the United States with good levels of income. Maybe they're a one income family, maybe they are a two income family. They simply cannot buy a home in the United States. And uh, many of you fundamentally understand this, right? Because you, you see what's happening in the marketplace that it's very hard to buy a home, but you don't understand just how bad the problem has gotten. This chart on the right will explain it to you. I don't know why these are in black. Hopefully you can see the ones in black, but this will explain it to you. Before COVID, in Tampa, Florida, which is considered to be a very affordable market, by the way, considered to be super affordable, you could buy a very small, very old starter home with an income of 32000 That was in 2020, just, a, just before COVID, right? Today, and this is the end of 2022, so more like three years. After three years, that same really old, really small home costs $72,000, this means that in the intervening three years, your income needed to increase by a shocking 123%. You probably didn't even get a 15% increase in those three years. You were lucky, maybe, maybe if you're lucky, you got 20%. But the home went up 123% because of two reasons. One is it went up, it's, you know, the, the price of the home went up. And then second, interest rates went up by the end of 2022. And now in 2023, of course, they're even astronomical. So this 123% number on the screen is higher now. It's not even 123, it's probably 150 or 160. Now you might think, well, he's just cherry picking Tampa, right? He's just like picking the worst example. Okay, every one of these on the, on the, on the screen until the 12th one, Las Vegas, is above 100%, 100% change in income in the last three years. And the United States, which is the last line in green, is an 88% change. In other words, people needed to make 88% more over the last three years to afford a median home. 88% in three years. That means th that people needed to get a 30% a year increase. And you might say, yeah, home prices are high, they'll come down. So at the beginning of the year, I track 20, I'm obsessive about tracking. So I track 21 different sources and their predictions, their predictions of home prices. Right. So here on the screen, you can see predictions all the way from the green. Realtor.com says home prices will go up 5% in 2023, all the way down to John Burns, which is the, the biggest data analyst company. They sell data. Right. And then CoStar, the second lar the largest. Both of these are saying home prices will go down 20%. Well, here we are. Right. We are at the, in, in October. Who's turned out to be right? Shockingly enough, it's the National Association of Realtors. They're usually the ones that are the most wrong. Home prices have gone up by 1%. So it's not like home prices are going down, even if you know mortgage rates have gone from 4% to 5% to 6% to 7% to 7.5% today, because there's a lot of stickiness. Most homes are locked in at interest rates below 4.5%. Uh, and because they're locked in, nobody wants to move. So there's very little inventory. And as a result, home prices have gone up by 1%, even though mortgage rates have almost doubled. Okay. I'll get started. So this is, a, this is the fun part. There are five ways to compare cities in the United States for rental property. You just saw why, right? The last two slides I told you, why in God's name do we really, really, really need to buy rental property? And, and Toby, by the way, is a huge fan of this. He, he can spend two hours in a podcast nonstop without taking a break, telling you about why real estate is, is the best thing and he, and he really eats his own dog food. So there's a lot of great reasons to buy rental real estate. I'm not saying buy it with me. I'm just saying buy it by yourself, right? But you need to know which cities to buy in. And anytime you go to a cocktail party, they're talking about, I am buying in this city and I'm buying in that city. I'm telling you 99% of the time, these people have no idea because that city that they're talking about was really great for real estate three years before. 
And now the only one making money when they buy in that city is whoever's selling the property to them. So you need to find your own cities. You need to figure out which cities are good and which cities are bad, right? How do you do that? Well, you do it by measuring those cities using five parameters, five different things that you're going to measure. And as you can see from the screen, the first one, I call it real focus is these five things, is population growth. So here's the rule. If the city that you're looking at, maybe randomly you went to a party and somebody told you about some city, Fort Wayne, Indiana, right? I'm making the city up, right? If the city is between 250,000 people and a million people in population, I'm gonna show you how to see that, then you want its population growth to be between 2011 and 2020, basically a decade, to be about 10.6%. So it's, its population growth should be 10.6% or greater, right, over that time. Now, there's a caveat, there's a catch, and here it comes on the screen. If it's a really large city, right, so a city of more than a million people like Phoenix or Philadelphia, San Antonio has more, got more than a few million people, Los Angeles, in those cities, that number 10.6 is, is not fair. Smaller cities go, grow slower. So you can use 7% growth number, right? And then what about the cities that are really small? What if, what if they're smaller than 250,000 people? Like one of my all-time favorites, St. George, Utah. One of my other favorites, Idaho Falls, Durham, North Carolina, Fort Wayne, Indiana. What about these cities? Well, they have to grow faster. Why? Because you're taking a risk. These are smaller cities. They're riskier. Well, you need to be rewarded for your risk, right? Well, then you only want to go with cities that are 15% or higher growth rate in 10 years, right? Now, here before I show you how to use this, right? Um, the, the, the big question is, how exactly, how do I um, apply this? The, the question is, this number, you can only apply it in 2023. And you're like, well, I'm at the end of 2023. The answer is, each year in January, we publish a new version of this. And I'll show you where to go and get it. By the way, I have no subscription. I don't charge money. I don't sell education. You, you basically can't give me any money related to location magic. But once in a year, I update the numbers and you're welcome to come and get them. So there's gonna be a new number for 2024. This number only works for the rest of 2023. It's gonna bump up a little bit. It's gonna go up from 10.6% to like 10.9 or 10.11.1, or something like that will happen, right? So that's the first number. And before I go on to the second real focus, let's actually look at this, right? So now I wanna show you examples. This is a lab. So I'm gonna show you an example of how you use this, okay? And here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna go to Google and I'll type in Columbus, Ohio, population, right? And when I do that, you'll immediately notice something very interesting and I'll make this, I'll zoom this so it's easier to see, okay? And notice this, Google's giving you this graph, right? You notice the city that I'm interested in, which I call the jewel of the Midwest is called Columbus, right? Columbus, Ohio. Now, notice that Google automatically gave me two more cities. AI, artificial intelligence, right? So it picked Cleveland, which is also in Ohio, and Cincinnati. These are both large cities in that market. But look at the lines. Cleveland basically is a city that is, it loses population slowly. And then every time there's a recession, it has a major dip. Then it continues to lose population slowly. Then it has a major dip then it continues to lose population slowly. And that's the definition of Cleveland and why I will never invest in Cleveland, right? Next, Cincinnati. This is a steady eddy market. It's a really nice market. It's a good market. It's steady eddy. Nothing happens to it. It doesn't go up. It doesn't go down. People that live in Cincinnati like it. Notice that there's no dips when there's recessions, right? So the people in Cincinnati love Cincinnati. They live there, but it's a steady eddy. The problem is this. When a, a city is steady eddy, you don't get that huge growth benefit which creates the demand. But in the same state, and Ohio has been a state that's lost population for decades, there is a jewel, and that jewel is called Columbus. And you can see what happens. Every time there's growth, Columbus, well, actually every single year, Columbus grows and grows and grows and grows, and then a recession happens. And then guess what happens? Columbus steals population. And where is it stealing from? Right here, from Cleveland. It's stealing the population of Cleveland. You always want to be in cities that are stealing population from others every time there's a recession because those cities do really, really well in a recession. So if you were in, in Cleveland, your rents would drop a lot in a recession. If you were in Columbus, they would increase because people are running away from Cleveland, going to Columbus because they know that there are more jobs there. You can see just how powerful this is just in the first piece. Now, 
let's talk about how, and I'm gonna go and get an Excel spreadsheet here. On the screen, on the right side, you now see an Excel spreadsheet. You will all receive this Excel spreadsheet. Remember, no one pays for anything, right? It's all given away. So on this spreadsheet, you'll notice that there are real focuses. I want you to look at the first one. It says real focus one population growth. There are two cells, one population in 2011, one population in 2020. And actually I'm about to update this because you notice that here, it's now updated to 2021. But you might say, but Neil, we're in 2023. Why are you talking about 2011 or 2020? You should be talking about 2021. The answer is because this is free public data. I will tell you where to go and get data that costs you thousands of dollars for 2023. But one thing I will also tell you is I've paid those thousands of dollars. I end up with the same list of cities. So cities don't change over years. They change over decades or even you know, centuries. They, they don't change very quickly. So trends 99% of the time, you can use older public data and end up with the same list of cities to invest in. But if you're paranoid about it, you can pay for neighborhoodscout.com. Feel free to write that down, neighborhoodscout.com. Or you can pay for localmarketmonitor.com. So thousands of dollars. Trust me, you're going to end up with the same list of cities. So back to this. Where do I get this number? Where do I get that number? I, I got to find these two numbers. Well, they're on the screen. Watch. So the last number is the number for Columbus in 2021. This got updated in the last few weeks. So when I taught Location Magic like eight weeks ago, it hadn't been updated. So now it's 2021. You notice the number says 906528. So I'm going to go here. I'm going to plug in 906528. Okay. Oops. Uh, sorry. I plugged it into the wrong cell. So I'm going to go plug it in here. Okay. And I'm going to go back. So now I'm going to go back to 2012. Remember, not 2011, 2012, because the year has changed. And Columbus was 812,872 people then. So I'm going to go here, 812, 872. Whoops. Oh, I'm doing it backwards. 906, 528. And I'm going to go here, go back to the 2012 number. Uh, there, 812, 872, 812, 872. And you notice that this cell turned green. So remember what I just showed you. I said to you, you want to be investing in cities where the population growth is more than 10.6% in this time frame, right? In a 10-year time frame, basically. And you notice Columbus is at 12. What do you think Cincinnati would be? Below zero. What do you think Cleveland would be? below zero. But do you know that home prices in Columbus are only 20% higher than Cincinnati and Cleveland? This by itself should tell you that most home buying in the United States is emotional. People don't make the decisions based on numbers and data because if they did, nobody would buy homes in Cleveland and very few people would buy them in Cincinnati. But there's the same number of investors buying in Cleveland, Cincinnati and Columbus. Clearly though, Columbus is much better. That is why when you do numbers based on math, your results are going to be better than everybody else. But even as a whole, the real estate market beats the stock market, right? Even as a whole, with people making all these emotional decisions. If you don't, if you make only logical decisions, you should be able to beat the stock market by 2x or 3x. In my case, over my career, I've beaten the stock market by 4.5x over a bunch of different projects. So does this make sense, right? Population growth, that was your first real focus. Let's move on to real focus number two. And real focus number two is median household income. Median household income. And real focus number two says, when you're looking at median household income between 2000 and 2019, now this is over a longer time. What we found was for income, you need to look at a longer time frame. Where population, we looked at 10 years. For median household income, we look at a higher a time frame. That's more correlated to your profits, right? So the number that we're looking for is 35.2%. You, you want median household income of any market that you're interested in, whatever market you came up with in your cocktail party, to be 35% growth or more in that time frame. And there's a website called City-Data. Everyone forgets the dash. So I'm just going to say city 
dash data dot com, that's going to give you this information. I'm going to give you a demo in a moment. Now, once again, 35.2%, it only applies for 2023. In January 2024, I'll publish a new number. It'll probably be slightly higher, it might be 38, 39%. All right. Okay. So let's show you where to get that number because you want to plug it into this spreadsheet that I'm giving you, right? All right. Let's go to city dash data dash data, right? Columbus comma OH, and you hit enter. And now you come to this, this page. Uh, sorry, ignore all the ads. It is free data. So um, so they're making money from the ads. Now, as I scroll down, you scroll and you scroll and you scroll and you scroll and you scroll, right? And you'll notice that there is this, estimated median household income. I'm going to zoom in again. So let's go zoom, 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 zoom. There we go. All right. Whoops. Right here, do you see estimated median household income in 2021 was 58K and then it was 37,897. This is why I have to change my system all the time because this number has also now changed, which means that in January, you'll get slightly updated numbers. Most of the time, a one year change doesn't really change the cities much. So here, I'm gonna say, okay, this number is 58202. And then on the left side, I'm going to put in 37897. This is the same. So I'm going to put 37897. You notice that this number immediately turned, this cell turned green and it's 54%. In other words, the median household income in Columbus, Ohio increased by 54% since the turn of the century, right? And you want this number to be at 56%. And you're like, oh, you know, Columbus missed that number. Yes. But keep in mind that the, the year has also changed, right? So there's a disadvantage here. I'm talking about 2000 and 2019. The year's now changed. This site has been updated. So once the, the number is updated for 2021, you'll be fine. So that number is going to work fine as, as, as soon as we take in 2021 data. So it's, you're close enough. You're very close. All right. Let's move on to real focus number three. Real focus number three is on the same page. So on that city data page, oops, this is four. Let's go back to three. Median house and condo value is real focus number three. And it's highly correlated to your profits because of course we're talking about home prices. You want to make sure that there is a 56% or greater growth in median house or condo value between 2000 and 2019. Once again, I'm, I'm going to update this number fairly shortly, uh, but very useful to look at it as it is. 56% growth. Now, where is it? Well, same website, citydata.com. And once again, this applies to 2023. It's going to get bumped up for 2024. So let's go back to that page. We were here, right? Right here. We were right there. Okay. Well, if I go down... Here, I see new numbers. So I see 2021 number, and I'm going to go here. Remember, this is, the, this is the, the place where I plug it in. So a median home in Columbus only cost $99,000 in the year 2000. Remember, this is the Rust Belt. This is the Midwest, right? So, so keep that in mind. $99,000, right? Today, that home is $219,200. So I'm going to go plug this in. 219,200. And you notice that Columbus comes out fantastic because what did I just give you? The number that you're going to use is 56%. That's the growth you're looking for. Higher is better. But home prices in Columbus have gone up by 121%. That's more than double this number in that time frame. Now, it's fairly common for that 56% number to be beaten in, in many parts of the US. So th this is one of those real focuses where higher is better. Maybe you're comparing Columbus with Fort Wayne, Indiana. Maybe you're using Idaho Falls. So don't just check off the box and say, yep, you know, it's more than 56%, I'm good. Why don't you compare between Fort Wayne, Indiana and, and, and Idaho Falls? Maybe, you know, Columbus has gone up 121%, but Idaho Falls has gone up 156%. Well, that's better. So that is real focus number three. Now let's look at real focus number four. And this one's very interesting. I tried, I spent a lot of time with my Ukrainian hacker trying to correlate 
crime to real estate profits. And I failed. I failed because I couldn't correlate. There was there didn't seem to be a correlation between crime levels and profits. Like high crime cities had uh, profits. Low crime cities had profits. And I was like, there's no connection here. There must be a connection. As it turned out, the connection was not crime level. It was change in crime level. Is crime going up? Is crime going down? Is it going up fast? Is it going down fast? So that change in crime level was, was huge. Okay. So on that same city data page that we were in, remember city dash data page that we were in is a crime table. And in that table, there's a number. I'm going to show it to you in a minute. And I want that number to be below 450. Okay. Below 450. But here's what I also want. And, and by the way, this applies to all years. The 450 number is not going to change year to year. So next year, when I publish new numbers, that 450 is going to stay at 450 because it's, well, I'll, I just like to say it's relative. It's not, it, it, this is the kind of number that um, doesn't bump up or bump down over time. So you, you, you want to be below 450 uh, in any year. Now, the key is not just that the number is below 450. You want to invest in cities where there's a reduction in crime. And that's very important because reduction in crime is tied to education levels. None of the real fo focuses have to do with education because I found I was getting the same exact results if I tied one of my real focuses to a reduction in crime. Reduction in crime and increase in education are very deeply tied together. Does that make sense? All right, so let's go back to that page. Where am I, where am I? Ah, here, city data. So we were here, right? We, we looked at median household income. We looked at median house and condo value. Now we're gonna scroll and we're gonna scroll for a while. So keep scrolling and scrolling and scrolling and scrolling and scrolling. And as we keep scrolling, lower down on this page, there's gonna be a table. And this is table is about, this table is about crime, right? So let, let's make this a little bit bigger. So we're looking for this table. And you notice that what it says is crime rates in Columbus by year. Oh, come on, come on. Sorry, every time I make the screen bigger, it sort of jumps. And I'm trying to make it as wide as possible so I can show you as much data as possible. And all kinds of crimes are in here. There's murders and rapes and robberies and assaults and burglaries and thefts and arson. They're all in here, right? So what, I'm, what you're looking for is this line. I don't want you to pay much attention to this. It, it, you don't quite know how to read this data. You don't need to read this data. Leave that to me. I want you to look at the blue line. In the table, the only line that you care about is the blue line. So what I want you to do is I want you to look at this line and you, you want to invest in cities where this number is below 450. And you might say, oh, shouldn't I invest in Columbus? This number is 673. Yes, but that was in 2007. The city has changed. You want to look for cities that were rough, but got better. Because if the cities were better, well, you're going to overpay anyway, right? So 2007, 673, 624, 591, 582, up a little bit, down, 567, 513, 465, 430. And this scrolls to the right. I'm not sure why it's not scrolling, but normally it scrolls to the right. I'm, I'm just going to make the screen a little smaller. Go back to 100, and then I should be able to see more data. There, okay. So you notice that crime in Columbus has dropped to half. The jewel of the Midwest started 2007 with a very sketchy 673, and then a very nice smooth decline in the you know 500s, 400s, 300s down. Down And yes, it goes up a little bit here and there. The data is never going to be super smooth, right? But the general direction is crime in Columbus is dropping, has been dropping for 15 years, and continues to drop at a fast rate. Those are the cities you want to invest in, right? And even though it's politically a problem to say this, crime in the United States has been dropping for 15, 20 years. It has been dropping. It sort of bumped up during COVID uh, a bit. But in general, crime in the United States has dropped a lot. So it, it's unusual for you to actually find a city where it's increased. Most cities, crime would have dropped. But if you look at high crime cities like Chicago or Memphis, you're going to see that even though crime has dropped, it, th those numbers are still very high. 700, 800, 900. You're looking for a number below 450. And Columbus matches it 
beautifully. And that's why I call it the jewel of the Midwest. Now, is Columbus my favorite state to in a city to invest in? Not even close. Not even close. I like Columbus. It's a nice city. But is it in my top top 10? Absolutely not. Right. But this was an example to show you that a state that has lost population for decades because of manufacturing job losses, Ohio, has radically different cities. Right. So there's four large cities in, in Columbus and we looked at uh, in, in, in Ohio and we looked at three of them. Do you see how dramatically different they are? And that's why investing by the numbers is incredible. So in the last you know, 30 minutes that I've been talking about this, because I was first talking about my experience, you've already learned so much about how to rank cities. But now let's look at the one that is the most important, the biggest, and that is, oh, come on, let me just skip past these, there it is. And that is 12 month job growth percentage. Of all the numbers, this is the real focus that matters the most because it creates the most amount of urgency for people to buy. And hopefully you already bought, right? And so when these job growth numbers are high, then for a number of years, two, three, four, five years, you're gonna see an in incredible urgency for people to buy because a very high job growth creates a very rapid increase in salaries and rapid increase in salaries means people can afford more. And hopefully they're either buying the home that you bought, so you're flipping it to them or they're renting it from you. Either way, high income growth is phenomenal and it's tied to high job growth. So where do we get this number? On a very strangely worded website. The website is actually called Department of Numbers. Yes, the government is phenomenally, um, you know, incredibly um, creative with its website numbers, departmentofnumbers.com. So the link is departmentofnumbers.com. Now, where are you going to get this link? Remember, I'm going to give you the Excel spreadsheet. Well, there's a cheat sheet in that Excel spreadsheet and the link is right there. So you don't have to worry about it. So, you know, you don't have to write anything down. So departmentofnumbers.com slash employment slash metro. So I'm going to go, you know, copy this link. And I'm going to go up here and I'm going to go plug it in. And when I go to this page, there's a bunch of things that you need to notice. This page can be quite dangerous. So you have to be um, very careful about the data on this page. OK, so the first thing I want you to notice is be very careful looking at monthly data. It doesn't mean anything like some retailer closed, some Amazon warehouse open. There's an Amazon warehouse in every city in the United States. It doesn't mean anything, right? So monthly numbers are really worthless. Please don't look at them. Don't make decisions based on them. But you can look at this. This is really important, right? One year job percent change. So this column is magic. It is absolute magic. When I click on this once, so I'm going to go ahead and click on this, click. These are the worst cities in America to invest in. Please, for God's sake, don't forget to click twice. Because if you click once and you go out and buy these things, you're going to send me lots of hate mail. These are the worst cities in America to buy. And unfortunately, they continue year after year to be in the same states. I see West Virginia so often. I see, um, you know, I'm, well, none of these. Um, let's see. I see West Virginia a lot. I see um, Michigan quite often. Um, Alabama sometimes. Let me go back and take a look at some of these others. Uh, Illinois. So a lot of in Illinois, unfortunately, that I get to see. Ohio is very common. You notice Cleveland. This is terrible. These are horrible numbers. We're not really interested in these numbers. So what we're interested in is to go back and click one more time. And when we click, we get some of the best cities in the United States, except for the one at the top. This is dangerous. So I'm going to say this. Midland, Texas and Odessa, Texas are two cities that are exempt from all of my rules. Midland, Texas, Odessa, Texas, because these are shale cities. They're usually either highest job growth in the United States or lowest job growth in the United States. And they can move in the matter of weeks from highest job growth to lowest job growth. Why? Because the price of oil changes. These cities basically exist for the purposes of oil, oil you know, uh, pulling oil out of the ground. And so their, their, their job growth can vary a lot. So please do not use my systems for Midland, Texas or Odessa, Texas. So skip that first one. And then you start seeing some really, really interesting cities in this list. And it's very exciting to see some, some of the cities that I care about the most. So of all the cities in America that I care about the most, the one that I care about the most is Fayetteville, uh, Arkansas. 
Fayetteville or Far Fayetteville. It, it's not actually the largest city. So this this is, um, well, I'm just going to go to maps.google.com and I'm going to type in Fayette, Fayetteville, Arkansas, right here. All right, so this is going to basically show me the city of Fayetteville. It's a metro. And Fayetteville is actually one of the smaller cities. The bigger cities, the one that more people know about are up here. There's Bentonville, where Walmart is headquartered, and Rogers next to it. And so this is the metro. This gray area here is my pick for number one metro in the United States right now. Number one in the United States. Now, each, each uh, month when I look at the list that we were just looking at, the cities in this list, Rogers, Bentonville, Fayetteville, Springdale, show up again and again and again. It's beyond the scope of this, you know, this training session on why this is happening, but trust me, it's an incredible, incredible metro. So let's talk about some of the other stuff that always shows up here. That's very exciting because I'm not interested in some city coming up once. I want to see it come up month after month after month after month for years before I say, that's a city that I'm going to put $20 million of my investor money in, right? So for me, I look at this data every single month and I just absorb this stuff. And I, I'll show you an Excel spreadsheet that the data sits in. So I see McAllen, Texas a lot. Why? Because Texan cities are becoming very expensive. They're becoming very, it's a red state with basically a bunch of blue cities that have high property taxes. And so people are leaving and going to other parts of Texas because they like Texas. McAllen is gaining. And one other thing, manufacturing is returning from China, but it's not returning to the US. You hear that on the news, it's nonsense. It's returning to Mexico. Why? Because Mexico has high quality labor and we share a border with Mexico. It, you, know, you have to burn an enormous amount of oil to get uh, Chinese products from the port of Shenzhen to Long Beach, which is the port that most of uh, the Chinese stuff comes into. It takes a huge amount of money. And China is no longer cheap labor. Would it surprise you to learn that an average Mexican makes only 60% of what an average Chinese laborer makes in the factories? Then Mexico is really cheap. And because of geopolitical reasons, there's reshoring and it's happening to Mexico. The city of McAllen is the closest city to the Mexican industrial zone, which is centered in a place called Monterey. So Monterey is on the Mexican side. McAllen's on the U.S. side. Traffic is passing through. McKellen's doing fantastically well, right? Check it out. Uh, San Antonio, see it all the time. Amazing city, same exact reason. San Antonio is the city that is on the freeway that comes from the city of Monterey, crosses the border. Well, the first major city you're going to hit is San Antonio, and San Antonio has rail connections. San Antonio has a inland port, so it has basically the way to take all that stuff that's coming in from Mexico and has the ability to distribute it, and that's why it shows up a lot. Kennewick, Washington is one of my favorite cities. It's the city in Washington that almost nobody knows about. Uh, sometimes people call it the Tri-Cities. Uh, so there's three little cities together. Kennewick's the largest of them. Amazing, amazing, amazing place. Uh, has a nuclear plant that luckily is, is is set to run until 2064. So it's funded for the next 30 or 40 years in case you're worried about nuclear energy. So that's big business there, but it's it's a terrific place to invest in. Um, you, you'll see a lot of Florida. So that's you know not unusual. Tampa, Florida, Coral, Cape Coral is where I have one of my properties. I recently bought land just personally for myself. I have no investors in it just, you know, and, it, and it's near Cape Coral, Fort Myers. And no, I'm not afraid of hurricanes. But when you, when you in Florida build a property after 1992, the new codes, the stuff that you see on TV, those were not the homes built using those new codes. Usually homes that were built using new codes, the only thing that really happens is the carpet gets messed up. So I'm not afraid of new construction in Florida. I'm afraid of buildings that were built before that time frame. All right, Austin, Texas comes up all the time. Salt Lake City, Jacksonville. These are, notice I'm skipping cities because they often don't come up very often, like Lebanon, PA. You know, it's, it's there for whatever reason. I'm not interested in investing in anything in Pennsylvania uh, because their cities don't come up often enough. But sometimes the city will rise to the top and then fall away and you'll never see it again. That's a perfect example. Uh, but Cape Coral, all the time. Austin, all the time. Salt Lake City, all the time. Jacksonville, all the time. These are amazing cities. Dallas is in there. So, these numbers, right? Let me tell you how to read them. Very, very simple. Never invest in a city with job growth below 2%. And that's what my what this this says, right? So, right? Oh, sorry. This was, I'm sorry, I'm going to change this. 
That 4% was because of a weird thing where cities were recovering from COVID. You know, when the recovery was happening, every city was about 4% because they had lost a bunch of jobs in COVID and they recovered. So the data was dirty for a while. But in all the years that I've been teaching, you know, uh, location magic, uh, it's 2%. So the number is 2%. But this is one of those numbers where higher is better. At 2%, you know, you'll do well with your rentals uh, or, or your, your you know, uh, appreciation value. At 3%, you'll be pretty happy. At 4%, you'll be buying champagne bottles. At 5%, you'll be dancing naked in the street with your champagne bottles. 5% rent growth is very rare. Uh, sorry, uh, um, job growth is very rare in the United States. We have it right now because, again, Midland, Texas is sort of weird. And, and some of these are very small cities, so be very careful. But you know, you notice that there are no large cities in the five percent range, unless you want to call Charleston, South Carolina, large. I don't really consider it that. The first large city in this list is down here, uh, Las Vegas, a million people. San Antonio, a million and a half. Tampa, about well, actually more than more than two million. So you start seeing some big cities in the four point five percent range, and that's pretty common. Um, they don't usually stay there. They 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 drop back. The cities don't stay. In, in the same range all the time. But as long as the city is stays at 3% and then sort of moves up to four and a half from time to time and it comes back and goes back down to three, but doesn't go below three, that's a good city to look at. It's, it's, it's in the Goldilocks zone, right? So when it's losing people, it still stays above 3%. When it's in boom phase, it goes all the way up to four and a half. At four and a half, people want to buy everything in sight and hopefully they're buying it from you. So that is location magic, is as simple as that. Here's the Excel spreadsheet. I'm, I'm gonna tell you how I'm gonna give it to you in a, in a minute here. The Excel spreadsheet, all you have to do is plug the numbers in and you should be able to compare any city in the United States. Remember the last one was 2%, right? So um, real focus five, job growth, you wanna be at 2%, three is better than two, four is really, really great. Using this, you should be able to compare any city in the United States. And for those of you that like hands-on labs, when I give you this Excel spreadsheet, please go ahead, repeat the same process. Remember the first one, we just searched Google. The second one, third one, and fourth one, we did city-data. And the fifth one, the last one, we did uh, job growth, right? And that job growth data was on that weird website, departmentofnumbers.com. Go ahead and fill these in and you'll notice huge difference. You'll notice that um, certain cities like Chicago, Illinois have horrible numbers. People, Chicago is a wonderful city. It was one of the biggest city in America 150 years ago. Unfortunately, the city is doing really poorly. And most people don't realize that because the halo around Chicago is absolutely in, in, insane. And so people make the same mistake of buying again and again in Chicago. No one in their right mind should be buying real estate in Chicago. That's my belief, right? But you see some cities that are doing a lot better, like Indianapolis doing so much better. Um, St. Louis just beginning to motor, just beginning to move forward. Reno, Nevada is just insane. I mean, it's like, oh my God, what can I buy in Reno, Nevada? I'm bidding on like three pieces of land in Reno, Nevada right now. Indy is incredible. These cities, you learn so much. You don't necessarily even want to be buying in cities that are like this. <laughs> you want to buy in cities as they're starting their upward curve and you can make an absolutely sickening amount of money in real estate. So that's location magic. I'm gonna take a break for a minute, but on the screen is your link. Hey, Hopefully Neil. you know how to use a barcode. Yes. I'm gonna pop in because there's a few questions that are specific. Absolutely. Is that okay or do you need a break? I uh, don't, uh, questions are good. The barcode basically should get you the spreadsheet and deck if you have any issues you know, let Anderson know and, and we'll send it over to you. There's the barcode. We tested it yesterday, so it should work. I think, uh, I think we have a link to multifamilyu.com forward slash AA. We can get the materials too. Yes. So uh, this barcode actually goes to multifamilyu.com slash AA. So this is just an easy way of getting it for people, but you can also plug that link into the uh, chat. Either way, end up getting the spreadsheet. Please remember that in January... If you go to the homepage of multifamilyu.com, you'll notice Location Magic has, is taught in January every year. And so uh, when you click on that link, there'll be a way there to get the updated spreadsheet. We don't update them spreadsheets at the end of the year, so it'll it'll make a slight difference. But what I can tell you is 90% of the cities are going to be the same. All right, so there's a few questions. If, if somebody's asking like West Coast, Florida is still a good market, I, like I, 
I'm, can I answer for you? Like use the spreadsheet, yeah. take a look. <laughs> yeah. Right. I mean, use it. I think you're, you're going to learn a lot more when you're, mm. when we do things, it sticks in our brain a different way from just listening to Toby or Neil, right? Mm -hmm. Doing stick stuff in your head for a long time. So in general, you'll find Florida, Floridian city is doing phenomenally well, right? So it really depends on whether you believe that climate change is going to have a very destructive impact on Florida or not. I don't believe so. Um, obviously be careful, don't buy in a flood zone, please, please, for God's sake, don't buy in a flood zone. Um, but otherwise, I, you know, maybe you don't want to buy very old property in Florida. Maybe you want to buy something that's late 90s because the, the building code changed after the 1992 hurricane, which was called Ian. And so after that, Floridian, you know, buildings, they're really strong guys. So there, there's two questions that I'm going to merge into one. Uh, and it, they, they, it's basically this. What if the values are way up? Like Columbus is 120%. When is when is it too high? Is there ever a situation where you're like, okay, this is this is getting too crazy. I need to back off. Um, well, the short answer is no, unless Columbus becomes the most expensive city in the United States, which happens to be San Francisco, by the way. So you you realize that Columbus's values as a percentage are up 120%. What does that mean? A home in Columbus is now two hundred and twenty thousand mm -hmm. dollars. That same home in San Francisco is close to two million dollars. Yeah. But San Francisco does not have ten times the income of Columbus. It has ten times the home price. So the ceiling for most markets in the United States is pretty low. So once you start going beyond five hundred thousand dollars in median home prices, I'd say be careful because now you're looking at Boston, Los Angeles, San Francisco, and it's time to be very careful uh, because their rents are not going up at the same rate. But when you're ranking cities, I do not think that there's a, a ceiling now. Yeah. Um, somebody says you were using a site, and here I'm just going to go back. I have so many questions that I'm trying to not pick ones that are more general. But you have you're using a site, and I forget the name of the site. I think it was city-data.com. Yes. If, do you have any backup sites, like, or do you always just use that one? And what if they get hit by a, a rocket and blow up, and now they're not around anymore? Do you do you have any uh, other sources? Yeah, it's Google. So let's say that I, I'm looking at real focus number three. I'm just going to randomly pick one, right? So median household income. Well, simply ask Google. You know, show me median household income in city name slash state name between this and that. Now, these days, there's something known as chat GPT, this incredible thing. So you can just say, show me median household income change in Columbus, you know, Ohio between this year and that year. And those years would be the ones that are on the screen. So this one, that one, remember, this is going to get updated in about three or four months. And you'll immediately get that number. You can even tell ChatGPT to compute the difference between them. Remember, it has to be higher than 35.2. All of those things can now be done by ChatGPT. And because the data that I'm using is old anyway, it's not newer than 2021, which by the way is the cutoff date for ChatGPT. Its knowledge is until the end of 2021. It's probably the best source today. Uh, somebody says, do we want to look at time periods of 10 years for both population growth and median household income? What I found is when I did, it actually slightly reduced my accuracy. I don't quite understand it. You know, one of the things is data is magic, but sometimes even to people like us, it's still magic. We understand what it does, but we don't always understand why. So I can tell you in a 20 year time frame, there's more correlation to your profits than in a 10 year time frame. You're welcome to look at 10 years. You'll probably still end up with very close to the same list. Uh, somebody says, once you've acquired a property, how do you decide when to sell? Do you do you look at the data and then see if it's turning down, or do you do, do you have any indicators that say hey, it's it's too much? What do you do? I'm gonna I'm gonna give you a very self serving answer. Um, <laughs> so uh, each year around the 20th of January, I teach a different uh, webinar. It's called, you know, real estate trends and you're about to get real estate trends, but this is, this is the second part of the year version. So it doesn't have cities. Um, the first half of this year, the, the course has, it has cities. And usually I cover a hundred and hundred, at least a hundred cities in it. 
and just come at the beginning of the year, get the knowledge. There's no subscription, there's no fee. Come at the beginning of the year in January. It's our most popular event because people wanna know which cities are beyond their prime. So we talk about the cities that are now slowing. We talk about the cities that are accelerating. Uh, in, in, a, in a way, that January presentation is what I got out of Location Magic at that point of time, right? So I'm, I'm using it constantly, so I'm getting stuff out of it, and my insights are then published in a PowerPoint format. Perfect. A uh, couple more. There's a whole bunch, but I'm not going to keep asking you questions because we've got to jump to the next one. Um, but people are talking about insurance costs, floodplains, all that stuff. Does that factor into your equation? Are, are you just using this as a tool to pick a general market and then you go and yes. you do analysis when you're diving down? Absolutely. So it's very important that this does not replace doing analysis on things like insurance. So Florida, for example, is a high insurance state. Texas is even higher, believe it or not. And uh, and Rogers, Arkansas is, uh, is, is very different from that. And so is, you know, Kansas City. Bottom line is, this is a way for you to pick cities that are going to be very profitable for you. But within every city, you need to do analysis. Doesn't take away the need for that. Yeah. Hey, hey guys, I'm going to let Neil go on. There's, there's probably, there's 15 open questions just so you know, but I'm going to try do my best to, to whack away at them. Uh, well, let's do this, Toby. I, I know how long the second part of my presentation is. Mm -hmm. So I think we can do questions for about four more minutes. I will okay. definitely finish on time. All right. Then I'm going to ask you some general. Uh, yeah. Some cities seem to not be on the job growth table like Long Beach, California. Is there another source that, that you use? It has to be. So bottom line is it in that case, it has to be um, um, the Bureau of Labor Statistic website. So this site is simply taking very complicated data from bls.gov, bls.gov, and presenting it in an easy to use table. There are several cities that don't appear here, uh, some big ones as well. Unfortunately, I don't know why. Maybe that those cities are clubbed, like maybe Long Beach is clubbed under Los Angeles, and I don't know that for sure. But mm -hmm. if you go to bls.gov, you can go as 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 much as zip codes. It's just uh, more painful to find the data. And, and that's somebody else's. For smaller cities, does it make sense to look at county level data? Like, do you do you get do you get it micro, or do you always start at the kind of the big? Um, whenever possible, I look at city level data. When uh, not possible, I actually look at MSA data. Uh, Metropolitan Statistical Area or MSA is actually more accurate than county level data because you can have you know, weird county splits, but an MSA is a really good way of looking at it. When I showed you the Rogers picture, that was Rogers Metro. You saw multiple cities in there and you saw the gray area, which was homes and the green area, which was, you know, the farms around it. That MSA is good. You can type, you can go to Wikipedia and type in uh, lists of MSAs in the United States. Mm -hmm. And that will show you every metropolitan statistical area. And you can see New York being the, the largest with, you know, I think 10 million people. And, and that'll, That'll tell you what the MSAs are. So you can do searches on, on um, uh, ChatGPT by using MSA. Perfect. Do you also use census, GIS, data population change? Do you use all the different sources or are there specific ones? I don't need to, but those are good sources. I think that just so you know, I now pay for data. I pay for data because I'm lazy and because I can afford it. So I'm not suggesting that you need to use more than location magic, but feel free. And just remember, guys, this is just to narrow your search. Like, it's almost like a screener where you're like, in the stock market, there's 3,000 listed companies, right? We want to be looking at about 20. So you got to use some rules to go, like, you know, me, I use 10 years of dividend growth minimum. I'm looking at 60 companies at any given time. Real estate's no different. I'm looking at a handful of cities it doesn't mean that other cities are bad because somebody was like, are you saying California sucks, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, oh, no, no, like no, I love California. I live in California. Opportunities are everywhere. But if you want to give yourself the biggest chance, then you're just narrowing the field into particular cities where the odds are in your favor. If this was gambling, you want to be the house. You don't want to be the gambler. Um, is this data applicable for all real estate, single family, multifamily? commercial $200,000 house versus $500,000 house. 
Yes, for single family. Yes, for multifamily. Absolutely not for commercial real estate. Do not use this data to find self storages, buy hotels or motels. No, it does not work. It may seem to work. It's going to lead you in the wrong direction. Do not use it. Perfect. Then let's keep going on because I, I got a bunch, but I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to move it down. I think that you're answering a lot of the questions that they're asking. Good. Um, a lot of people are asking very specific things like, you know, if I'm watching I, uh... before I purchase, well, this is general guys. We're, we're using location tools to figure out what's the best market. Then you apply more micro stuff on. You That's know, right. This isn't, stuff. this isn't a, you know, course on how do I buy a house? This is a course of how do I figure out which cities I should be investing in and which cities I should stay away from. I think you still need more instruction on if you've never bought a house or you haven't figured out how to evaluate, a, you know, a rental property from another one. There's still more stuff. In fact, Toby, you know, has other folks that are both on his YouTube channel. Check it out. Check out his YouTube channel. He also has other people that have come on to the Anderson uh, group that actually have presented some of those tools. We we just like people that actually have a methodology. So like I, I'm a I've, I've looked at taxes the same way. I, I treat everything kind of the same. You're trying to get the general tr trend. So, you know, if you're in the right arena, you know, if this was, I don't, I don't know, a good sports analogy, but you want to make sure you're on the right field. Yeah, absolutely. Step after, come out of your hair. Let's do the three real estate defense. And then we'll do some more. Awesome. All right, guys, let's jump into trends, right? So we, we looked at a methodology. Now it's time to jump into a trend. These are killer 2023 real estate trends. And they're going to talk about upcoming distress and how you can benefit from it. So I'll start with this guy. This dude owns 33,000 multifamily units. So he sounds a little bit flippant, but just listen to what he's saying. Joining us today, Carroll founder and CEO Patrick Carroll, whose company manages more than 33,000 multifamily units across nine states. There's $1.5 trillion of debt maturing on commercial real estate and by 2025. So sellers are not realizing how much their properties have lost value, and they're not willing to dump their properties yet because they haven't felt enough pain. They're about to start feeling pain. These lenders are spooked. There's no lending going on. There's no transactions going on. Uh, and it's going to be ugly. I mean, it's going to be at least as bad as 0809. People don't want to say that. But it's, it, you know, downturns always are worse than the one before. And upturns are always better. I've rode the wave of, of price appreciation, rent growth, things like that since 2011. Well, the party's over, unfortunately. It's going to be okay in multifamily, but the office market is going to be destroyed. destroyed. You know, hotels are going to be destroyed. It's going to be ugly. Yeah, with that very bullish uh, update. Okay, just kidding. Let's get started with location magic. So I'm going to skip past all these slides because I already told you my story. All right, let's move to trend number one. Everyone talks about inflation, but should we really be talking about inflation at this point of time? Or it could be something different. Without getting into a red versus blue debate, uh, you should know inflation is not a United States problem. Helicopter money didn't create our inflation. Supply chains did. Putin's war did. Dozens of countries that didn't print any money during COVID are facing inflation just like us. In fact, half the world has double digit inflation. Take a look at this chart on the right. Americans, we whine about half a year of 9% inflation. Anyone want to live in these countries, Zimbabwe, Lebanon, Venezuela, look at these inflation numbers, not me. I'm gonna take the US political dysfunction and all. And do keep in mind that the inflation picture is unquestionably getting better. So inflation peaked right here in June, 2022 at 9.1%. And as of June, 2023, a year later, it was already down to 3%. Actually, core CPI last month came in at 0.1, 0.1. So if you take 0.1 for a month and multiply it by 12 months, you come up with 1.2%. That's actually below the Fed's benchmark. Now, does that mean that the Fed's gonna start cutting rates? No, they wanna see lower numbers for a significant amount of time, three months, four months, six months, before they're like, okay, we won our fight and we should start lowering numbers. So it takes time, but the fight 
we believe has been won. And the Fed can't say it because the moment they do, the markets go up and that creates new inflation. So they have to be very, very careful. But the numbers tell us a story that you won't hear in the media. There are two lines on this graph, right? And one of them, as you can imagine, is the, in, the Fed's key interest rate. So it was zero because of COVID. So you see here, zero, zero, zero. And then they start increasing, increasing, increasing. And we're sort of here right now, right? The second line, the red one, basically is this line that shows, right, the inflation rate. So you, you know, see infl core inflation going up here and then down here. This is core inflation. It's different from that 9% number that I was using. Here's the, the significance of this. Do you see right here, these two numbers have intersected? Now, my data shows that if I go back all the way to the Second World War, any time the Fed does this, they raise interest rates, which lowers inflation, the point at which the inflation cuts the interest rates and goes lower, that's the point where we know that we won the war with inflation. The Fed won't say it because when they say it, it creates other problems, but that's usually when we won the war with inflation. So let's look for some other data to see if what I'm saying makes a lot of sense. Well, this very kind of weird graph is the ISM manufacturing index, okay? And you notice if you look very carefully, the graph has two colors white here above 50 and sort of a pinkish color uh, below 50, right? So obviously 50 is the, the, the median point, the, the middle point. Above 50, manufacturing in the United States is growing. Below 50, it's shrinking. Now, you see these bars, these gray bars, those are US recessions all the way from the second world war, 1948, 1953, 58. You notice something, every time there's a recession, manufacturing is below 50. Basically, a manufacturing recession eventually leads to a U.S. recession because manufacturing is leading indicator. So it tends to drop well before the recession starts. So what's happening right now? Well, manufacturing in the United States, and here's a zoomed in view for you, has now been negative for 10 straight months. This goes up to August. September was also negative. It's been negative 10 straight months. In fact, the manufacturing level today of 46.4 that level is below nine of the last 12 recessions that I've shown you since the Second World War. So this is showing deeply recessionary data and recessionary data usually does not lead to inflation. It leads to something different, deflation. And is that being supported by other things? Yes, it is because the prices paid by the world for raw materials were up to crazy levels here, right? So you see this is 2021. And now you see that those numbers drop. So this is until April, and this number is now dropping again in, in May, June. I should update this graph, by the way. It's an old graph. Um, so that number is continuing to drop, and that shows that the prices raw, prices for raw materials in the United States are, are – the prices are not dropping, but the increase in those prices, the inflation is, is dropping. Now, this one is much more important, supplier delivery time. As you can imagine, when there's lots of demand, it takes longer for suppliers to deliver it right? So supplier delivery time goes up. And you notice right here, October 2021, this time was the highest in history. It was about 60 days delivery time. Imagine, you know, stuff, just stuff that's supposed to get to your store and, and normally gets there in about one day, two days, three days from whatever warehouse is now taking 60 days to get there. Well, look at the number today. It's below zero. You know what below zero means? Warehouses are overstocked. Well, that's usually not good for demand and usually means some level of deflation. And, and all of you, you know, you're gonna start typing in questions saying, but Neil, the labor market, it's really tight. I mean, oh my God, you know, there's no, you know, there's so many open jobs, blah, blah, blah. I get it, I get it guys, but it's also loosening. Understand this, the labor market is not a leading indicator. It never tells us what's happening when the economy is going down or going up. It is a trailing indicator, meaning, you don't really look at labor market data and make decisions, but I want to point out that the labor market is also loosening. There were 11 million open jobs in at the end of Q1 in the United States. Today, that number has dropped to 8.8 .8 million. So there's something there, but always know the labor market is a trailing indicator because not until the people lose their jobs does that number really make any sense. And by that time, everyone knows that you're in a recession. But other things can tell you a lot more. Commodities, energy, metals, crop costs. Do you see a pattern here? Up, 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 up. 
you know, April, June uh, of uh, July of 2022 was the peak and now a nice decline in everything. And you might say, is it really everything? The answer is yes, because of this website. I track global freight prices, basically the cost to take stuff from China and bring it to the United States. And you can see that these numbers here, so this is uh, you know, 2017, 2018, 2019, 2020, a shipping container from the port of Shenzhen in China to the port of Long Beach in California basically cost about, you know, I'd say probably $1,400, somewhere in that range, and pretty much the same, right? All steady eddy. And then that $1,400 container goes up on this day to $11,000, right? So it went up basically seven or eight X because of supply chain problems. And today that number has gone down to $1,499. So it's uh, about the same as here, but you're forgetting inflation. In three years, we've had around 25, 30% inflation. So if the same demand was there on this side and, and on this side, well, adjusting for inflation, wouldn't this number be closer to 2000? Why is it so low? Because demand is falling. It takes, by the way, 120 days for that demand to show up because this, this is shipping containers now. So it will take a while for that information to flow into the United States and for prices to start dropping here. Shipping containers are a leading indicator because we're looking at what people in Shenzhen are charging for the ships that are in the port right now. And you're, so, so, you know, this, I'm, I'm going to skip past this, but basically there's a lot of indicators showing cooling. My message is this. Inflation was something to worry about in the last 18 months. Today, as an investor, you should worry about temporary disinflation, right? ING, and this is a, this is a big uh, local macro group, they basically are saying the drop in commodity prices seems to reflect the stuttering rebound of China. China is doing really poorly, very, very poorly. Uh, potentially a U.S. recession. There's a lot of supply side of destruction in Europe because their, their energy costs are very high. It's indeed possible that inflation could turn into temporary disinflation. So for those of you that think that inflation is going to stay this way for years, I don't think the math supports you at all. And that was trend number one. Let's move on to trend number two. Is single family inflation immune? We want to know, is single family a inflation immune market? Um, because it hasn't moved much. Why hasn't it moved? Well, I showed you this list before. Now I'm showing it to you in a different way. So remember, I obsessively track um, home price growth forecasts. So these are the mixed forecasts for 2023. And as you can see, there's green ones, realtor.com plus 5.4% for 2023. I'm, I'm sure they're very bullish. And then at the bottom right are the two big guys, CoStar and John Byrne saying home prices are going to drop by 20%. Well, nine months have already passed. We're in October, right? So we should have a sense of where home prices are. They're up. They're up 1%. And the big reason for that is lock-in. Interest rates for the vast majority of homes in the United States are locked in under 4.5%. A lot of them are locked in under 4%, some even under 3%. My home, the one that I'm, I'm sitting in right now, is locked in at 1.75% for the next 25 years. And because of that, people are not moving. There's no mobility. There's no supply in the marketplace. So home prices in the United States are very, very strongly supportive, very, very strongly supportive um, of, you know, and of, of prices are supportive of home prices, and that's why you're not seeing much of a, a slope down. Why is this important for you? Well, it's important because you're looking to buy rental real estate. So you have to understand that there isn't really a huge risk of home prices falling. I was on a show with Toby, which, I, by the way, is, is the, the, the show that has the most number of views on Toby's channel. Uh, for any any um, you know um, uh, any uh, video that he has a guest on, so I, I think we have like 120,000 uh, views because we were really forecasting this stuff, right? And there was so much gloom and doom, and and Toby and I were chuckling. This was about a year ago, where people were like, oh, home prices are going to go down 20 percent, 30 percent. This is going to be worse than 2008. And it's like, do these people not understand? These are locked in loans, and there's no distress here in this marketplace because all the people that are buying them. They're not those undocumented farm workers in Madeira. These people have money. So as, as we thought, nothing much happened. And, and you know, home prices at this point are pretty much steady. And by the way, I don't expect them to go up. I, I expect them maybe to go down, maybe 1% or 2%. Most people can't even feel 1% or 2%. Now, they did fall in some places. 
And so you should be you you should understand that the, what I just said, one percent in the U.S. That's the whole country, right? There are markets that were overheated, right? And the one that I would say is probably the most overheated, this one, Austin. So it's down about nine point seven percent. But keep in mind, it went up seventy two percent after COVID. So it's up seventy two, down ten still up 62, which is still one of the biggest increases in the United States. So a lot of these are ultra hot markets and they saw price adjustments. Um, my my market, you know, I live in the San Francisco Bay Area. So you see San Francisco there, you see San Jose, that's number one, number two, most expensive markets in the US. So that makes sense. Phoenix and Austin are there because simply because the increase since COVID was just too much. And so the, the markets are adjusting, they're not dropping, but they're adjusting. So bottom line is this, the single family market in the United States is extraordinarily resilient. It has outperformed every bullish or bearish uh, commentator simply because of the lock-in effect. Keep in mind, we're, we're talking about you know, 40, 50 million loans that are locked in for the next decade, sometimes for the next two decades. And that puts a floor under single family prices. That's a trend. You should understand the value of that. Not every place was that lucky. Not every place locked in prices. Not every market locked in prices. And as a result, we are up facing a $500 billion office real estate apocalypse, apocalypse, which has wide ranging problems for lots and lots of real estate investors in lots and lots of different markets, including single family. And so let's talk about trend number three, the real estate office apocalypse. Before COVID, 95% of offices in the United States were occupied. Now, occupied doesn't necessarily mean there were people in there. Occupied means someone was paying for the lease, right? That number has now dropped. Now, the number on the right is the occupancy number. It's not necessarily the lease number, and I'll explain why the, the occupied number and the lease number are different. So basically, there's a company that is the number one company in the US for card swiping. You know, when you go to these, uh, these um, offices, you have to swipe that card. Well, this company is the one that makes those little swiping devices. So they have a very good amount of data on how many card swipes there are. That 57% is the card swiping number, which means that people are coming into the office and they're coming in two days a week, three days a week. Some, some people are coming in four days a week. Um, and there's still some companies that are doing five days a week, but the vast majority of them are giving them some days off. You might say, yeah, but you still need an office because they're coming in three days a week or four days a week. The short answer is that's not how companies are doing things. Most companies that are that are renting expensive space, especially in downtowns, are simply saying, I'm going to stop giving people cubicles. I'm basically just going to give them a space to work. They come in, they bring their laptop, they plug it into the monitor and they're working. And when they're done, they take their laptop away and work from home the next day. And so as a result, what is happening is that as leases are rolling over, and remember office leases are not like not like single family, they're not one year leases, they're not two year leases, they're five years and 10 years. So it's taking a long time. This is a slow moving apocalypse, but each year as leases renew, we are seeing a stunning reduction in leases. Morgan Stanley, for example, says office and retail property valuations could fall as much as 40% from peak to trough increasing the risk of defaults. 40%, that seemed like a shocking number, right? Well, let me show you my market. I live in the San Francisco Bay Area. This is a famous building. If you lived in San Francisco, you'd know exactly where it is. It's, it's, it's on California Street near Market. And this building is a one of the headquarters of Wells Fargo. This building was evaluated at $1,000 a square foot, a little more than $1,000 a square foot in 2019. It just sold for $200 a square foot. That is an 80 plus percent discount. And if you think I just cherry picked one building, diagonally opposite this building is the Union Bank building, which just sold for a 76% discount. Apocalypse. And that apocalypse is killing everything else around it. On the left side are two hotels, which are very heavily dependent on San Francisco's office market for their revenue. Park 55 and Hilton San Francisco Union Square have just defaulted on their loans. The total default, three quarters of a billion dollars. On the right side is my wife's favorite mall. She doesn't go there anymore, unfortunately, because the Nordstrom shut down. You can see that the Nordstrom thing there on the, on the screen. Um, this is uh, Westfield San Francisco Center. 
their mortgage was $558 million. And Westfield, which is a $50 billion company, has just handed over the keys. So it's not just, it's not just office. It's affecting all the real estate around it with these mega defaults. Right. James Egan from Morgan Stanley says refinancing risks are front and center for owner of properties from office buildings to stores to warehouses. The maturity wall here is front loaded. What that means is a lot of these buildings have to be refinanced next year in 2024. So the risks are very short term. Right now. What about the banks that are giving these buildings uh, the loans? What about them? What about their risk? Well, Goldman Sachs estimates that commercial bank lenders that are small, by the way, Lenders below $250 billion of assets in the U.S. are considered small assets, small to mid-size. So that's what you see on the screen. Those people, 80%, 80% of commercial real estate lending is from those guys, right? And here's a breakdown. 46% of all retail loans in the United States are small and regional and local banks. We're not talking Wells Fargo, Chase, and City. We're talking small banks that can very easily be affected if a significant percentage of their uh, lending just disappears, right? And that's what's happening. 46% of retail, 31% of industrial, 30% of office, 37% of hotel is from regional and local banks. Now, you know something very interesting on this slide? The apartment bar. Why is it so small? The number one asset class in America is apartments, right? So in multifamily, why is that number so small? 19%. That's because apartments like single family are a privileged asset class. What do I mean by privileged asset class? Well, there are three separate government institutions whose only job it is to keep the single family and multifamily asset class liquid. They are called Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and HUD. HUD's only for multifamily, but Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac do both single family and multifamily lending. And these three are very, very aggressively active right now to keep the multifamily market stable. So they're lending, which means that multifamily guys like me usually don't go to small to medium banks. We get better pricing from the quasi-government organizations, Freddie Mac, Fannie Mae. And that's why you notice that number is 19%, which means that the coming contagion is likely to affect retail the most, bigger bar on the screen, and affect apartments the least, smallest bar on the screen. And this is already affecting stock prices of real estate investment trusts or REITs that are publicly traded. New York City's REITs are now down more than 50%. I wouldn't be surprised if they dropped to 70. Now, before you start plugging stuff into the chat saying, but what about converting you know, uh, these buildings to apartments? Well, that's not gonna save offices. For one simple reason, here's a study of New York City uh, you know, offices that are eligible for conversion. The study found that only 3% of 1,100 build office buildings can be converted profitably. Nobody's gonna do them for free. There has to be profit, there have to be investors. And viable residential conversion is only for 3% of 1,100 buildings. This concept of conversion to apartments is just nonsensical because they're not the same asset type and the math just doesn't work. Nobody's doing the math. People are just saying, we're just gonna convert all these things to multifamily. The answer is, no, you're not. It's not going to get there. It doesn't work for condos either. So bottom line is, analyst after analyst, and these are the people from Fortune Magazine, are warning that that what is happening is a lot of these super expensive markets, especially downtowns, they re heavily rely on property taxes. And obviously property values go down in San Francisco by 80%. Guess what's going to happen? An urban doom loop. And that's what you're seeing on the screen. Urban doom loop. Just, San just New York is supposed to take a $49 billion loss just over the next five years. $49 billion in one city. And all these guys from Fortune think that this is not a short-term thing. There's going to be a massive disruption in the value of commercial real estate. Commercial real estate doesn't include multifamily, both in the short term, next two years, and in the medium term, we're talking five to 10 years. And the tipping point is three months from now. 
in 2024, 1.4 trillion, that's $1,400 billion of commercial real estate loans are due this year and due the next year. And even superstars that have tens of billion dollars in assets might think about defaulting next year. Oops, they've already defaulted. Superstars on this top right of the screen, Blackstone, Brookfield, PIMCO, what's common amongst them? They've already defaulted on buildings and they will continue to default. Doesn't matter that they're you know, superstar companies, it just no longer makes sense for them to keep putting money into these buildings that are bleeding huge amounts of cash. And as a result, Richard Barkham from CBRE says, this might take 10 years to fix. It's too big. There's just too many of these buildings. It's going to take 10 years to fix. So here's my trend number three. It has nothing to do with office. Obviously, you don't want to touch that, that asset class with a 20-foot pole. Here's my trend number three. Real estate anywhere near downtowns in the United States is going to be depressed for a decade, for one decade. Yes, this includes single family. Yes, this includes multifamily. Wherever you're investing, draw a five mile radius around downtown and stay out of it. And I'll end this presentation with my number fourth trend. This is the one that's closest to my heart. Uh, and this is multifamily. Is distress coming for the most privileged asset class in the United States? Because we are hearing and you are hearing that properties are going back to the bank. But before I do that, I want to share something with you about my passion. I've been very lucky in that in my, you know, when I was in my tech careers, I bought buildings all over the United States. They made a huge amount of money. Then I became a professional in real estate because I realized that there weren't, you know, nerds like me in real estate. And I think real estate needs people like me. And so I, I've been lucky enough to build a portfolio that's almost a billion dollars in value. But I was dissatisfied because the problem was I was buying apartment buildings and improving them. And when I improved them, the rents became crazy for how old these buildings were. Uh, people were paying them and I was making money, but it, it was, you know there was something wrong there. Then I started building buildings and I thought that's how I'm going to fix America's problems. I'm going to make a huge number of these units. And then I started building apartment buildings in like superstar markets like you know Austin and, and, and San Antonio and, and you know these kinds of big markets, Phoenix. And they ended up being class A buildings and my rents ended up being $2,300, $2,400, $2,500 for an apartment. And I was like, I'm still not fixing America's problem. So I did a lot of research. You know me, I'm, I'm, just, I'm a geek. I'm just basically gathering data to see if an insight comes. Eventually what I realized is this, there's 18 million families in America that make 60 to $80,000 a year. So right here, 60 to 75K, right? These people can no longer afford to buy single family homes, but they also don't wanna live in my apartments. They live there because they have no choice. So I decided I'm going to give them a choice. So I created a mission and it's called Mission 10K. And my mission is to build over the next five years, 10,000 rental homes in the United States. These are all townhomes. They're all very nice looking nine foot ceilings, granite countertops, you know, small little backyards, uh, one car garages, not two because math doesn't work. But here's the beauty of my buildings. And by the way, this picture is of one of those Mission 10K communities. It's completed. It's 100% occupied. The beauty is this right here. I said, I am not going to build a single townhome if its rent is over $2,000. Now, of course, that number is inflation adjusted. But at the moment, the community that this picture is from, its rents are $1,700, which is $20,000 a year which means that if a family earns $60,000 a year, they can live in a brand new townhome in a beautiful community that has, you know, it has a garden and it has a playground and it's got a dog park and, it, and it's got a barbecue pit. They can live there. It doesn't have pools, doesn't have gyms. I mean, that's too expensive, but they can live in the middle of a city right next to all of the amenities and not be rent burdened if they make $60,000 a year. I did it. It worked. It became my most profitable project. And so now I'm taking this concept and replicating it over 100 communities of 100 units each, 10,000 total, Mission 10K. 
And I would love for you guys in any way that you can to join my mission and, and we'll be providing more details to you about Mission 10K. But you'll hear a lot more about this. And I think given the uh, profit with a purpose, um, you know, um, focus of this, I wouldn't be surprised if you hear it on, on, on television or on the internet. So this is my mission right now. I'd love for all of you to join me in Mission 10K. All right. Multifamily distress. Over 30% of all properties purchased by syndicators using floating debt in 2020, 2021 and 2022 are now bleeding cash. The number will be 40% on July 1st. Bleeding cash. You're not hearing much about it, but there's significant problems in multifamily properties today. 23% of CMBS debt this is a, a big lender to multifamily. That debt that is maturing by the end of this year will not be refinanceable under any realistic scenario. That's $6 billion of debt just for CMBS. And so now we have 2,500 signs of distress in multifamily. Why 2,500? Because of this number. You see this, right? So there is a way to calculate distress in multifamily. It's called a DSCR. It's basically one of those technical numbers, right? When a DSCR goes below 1.05, the property becomes distressed. Basically, it's bleeding cash. It's it's at the point where, you know, there's a hurricane and three of the roofs blow up and you have to sell the property because you can't pay for them. Things like that, right? So 2,500 properties in the United States are in distress. And these properties are pretty large. On, on average, they're like 150, 200 units. The average property is probably worth 30, 40, 50 million dollars. So we're talking about $75 billion worth of properties that are now in distress. My friend, Ivan Barrett, who buys a lot of these distressed properties is basically saying, there's gonna be blood. There's gonna be a good number of sponsors who bought properties that are very expensive and they'll have to consider selling for pennies on the dollars. Otherwise they lose all of their investor equity. And it's already started. Arbor, one of the lenders, foreclosed on a $229 million portfolio in Houston, 3,200 apartment units, huge losses for the lender. And I think somewhere around $50 million of investor equity completely lost. And as a result, we're seeing price drops. Remember, multi single family, no price drops because of lock-in. Well, multifamily rates were not locked in. People were using bridge rates or floating debt. That debt was floating. And for the last 18 months, it's been floating upwards, going from 4% to 5 to 6 to 7 to 8 to 9, and in some cases, 10%. And as a result, James Eng, my friend, I'm going to be seeing him tomorrow because I'm opening his conference in Dallas in, in the morning. James Eng says, there's a property, a specific property in Dallas, Fort Worth, 300 plus units. In November 2021, this property was worth 47 million. Today, it's worth 35 million. So a price reduction as high as 26.5% in multifamily. We're not talking about office or other asset classes that go up and down a lot, but in multifamily, you're seeing these kinds of reductions. Now, this is just one example. It's one property. So here, PREP did an analysis of different kinds of properties in the United States. You notice Multifamily down 22%, industrial, which is another asset class that's you know very strong because of the Amazon effect, down 21%. Please ignore this one. They they actually, this should not have been on the slide. They didn't do a full survey of this. Hotels, they think are down 30% if, if they're large. These are all large properties. Uh, mixed use down 40, 42%. This is basically apartments plus retail or apartments plus hotel. Um, offices down 48%, retail down 57% if they're large. There's distress everywhere. And now I want to say something that is very counterintuitive. Distress equals opportunity. Opportunity equals distress. There's really very difficult to make money today with all the inflated prices that you know many of you have talked about in this session already without distress. And there's distress coming. If you understand retail today, it's a great opportunity for you to go into retail. If you understand hotels, it's a great opportunity for you to go into hotels. If you understand office, run in the other direction because there is no opportunity there for office for at least the next decade. Multifamily is perfect because we never get 22% price discounts. I mean, the most that I've seen in my career is 4%, 5%. I mean, we had three months of 5% discounts after COVID started and then those discounts were gone. 
And so we are tracking every city in America that is hit the most by interest rate hikes. Now, if you don't understand cap rates, you this column won't make sense to you. So I'll just explain this to you. Phoenix basically is a 25% discount city right now, and so is Boston. Raleigh, Durham, and Charlotte, both in North Carolina, are probably 20% discount cities, where all these others are maybe a little bit less than 20%, maybe 19, 18% discount sort of cities. Some markets in the US have not seen huge discounts. So Philadelphia is actually an interesting city to be looking at. Um, because there's a lot of demand in Philly. Philly is sort of moving forward as a, as a city. It's been a perennial, perennial non-performer, but really moving forward right now. And so not every city is affected, but overall, a lot of the boom towns are affected. Another thing that's happening that's challenging is rents are beginning to learn uh, return to normal. In the United States, rents go up 2.5%. If you look at like a 50-year trend, they go up about 2.5% a year. Why? Because inflation's at two. What? Rents are tracked with inflation. If inflation goes up to four, rents go up to five. Inflation you know, goes up to eight, rents go up to nine. And, and you saw that in the 80s when we had high inflation that rents were really crazy, right? And so we, we got that huge rent increase in 2022. And that's when you also saw inflation going up. Now that inflation is coming down, rent growth's coming down. And it's basically rent growth in the United States over the last 12 months is sort of flat or down half a percent. And that's affecting multifamily. If rent growth was high, their profits would be higher. So they'd be able to sell at a higher price. They can't do that because rent growth is flat. And some cities are actually taking bigger hits. The one city I want to mention that's specifically taken the biggest hit is Austin, Texas. This is the biggest boom town in America. No, it's not any other city. The biggest boom town in America unquestionably is Austin, Texas. Nothing wrong with the city. Amazing job growth, amazing employers, amazing Fortune 500 companies, but it was too expensive. Rents were too high. They went up too quickly. Prices were too high. They went up too quickly. And you saw that on the single family side, uh, about a 10% reduction in, in uh, home prices, while well, you're also seeing an 11% reduction in rent prices. So it's not down enough for me to start looking at buying in Austin because they were still high, but we're beginning to see some opportunity. And then expenses, whenever there's high inflation, operating expenses go up. So normally in the multifamily industry, operating expenses go up 2%. But if you look at this chart, they're up 13% in two years. That's creating distress in the multifamily marketplace. You know what else is creating distress? Supply. There's a very large number of brand new units coming in in 2023 and then also in 2024. So definitely more in 2023. That's why rent growth is zero. Why? Because you have all these brand new units coming in. They're giving you one month free, two months free. In Salt Lake City, they're giving you three months free. And so that's driving rents down to 0% for now. And I don't expect that to change for a year because look, 2024 right here in red is also above trend. So 2023 was just a hideous amount of, you know, of, of new uh, construction delivery. 2024 though is pretty bad. Here's the opportunity. Right here, do you notice this, this falls and it falls to a very low number, very, very low, much, much lower than we need as a growing country. Why does it fall? Interest rates. Today, most people cannot make their numbers work for new buildings. So they've paused things or they've made their project smaller. Your 300 unit apartment project is now 150 unit apartment project. Or they're basically just saying, we'll, we'll build it very slowly. We'll, we'll, we're not gonna build it all of it right now. We'll build a little bit of it now and then we'll wait for interest rates to go down. So as a result, we are building a brand new supply hole. These numbers, 80,000 units uh, a quarter, this is too low. This is absolutely unquestionably far too low for the United States. We need 120,000 or 110,000 units. Anything below that, I'd, I'd say probably at least 100,000 units. So you're building a 20,000 unit apartment whole per quarter, 80,000 a year. That means rent growth in 2026 is going to be furious, fantastic rent growth right? So today, a market like Austin is very highly challenged. But in 2026, maybe 2027, that market will do really well because right now, nobody's building anything in Austin. It's the market that's most affected. So understand the cycle. What takes things down is also ironically what takes them up three years from now. So I think you've figured out my, the last part of my presentation, which is, is this a bad time to buy apartments? Ironically, it's a terrific time to buy apartments because of interest rates, because of mortgage rates. Remember, multifamily prices are not falling because of the lock-in effect. 
but their mortgages are going completely insane because your mortgage, you know, was very small at 3% interest rates, you know, two, two and a half years ago. And now that interest rate is seven and a quarter. And so as you can imagine, your mortgage payment has gone completely insane. Here it is right there. This is your rent. It's gone up. You can see the rents going up. But this is ridiculous. So the gap between a U.S. mortgage and U.S. rents is the largest in history. And I don't expect that to change because of the lock-in effect. We do need 4.3 million more apartments by 2035. We're just not building enough of them. We're, some years we build enough, and then something like these interest rate hikes happen, and then basically that, that kills the momentum, and then we basically end up creating a brand new hole. In case there's people amongst you who completely ignored what I said about deflation, maybe you only believe that there's going to be inflation for the next five years. Maybe like, you know, huge inflation. It's going to be 5% a year for the next five years, Neil. Okay, fine. Whatever. I don't believe you, but whatever. Take a look at this circle on the screen. This is what happens to rents when inflation is high. This is 1974 to 1984. Obviously, that was a time with very high inflation. But look at this rent growth. It's three times higher than the average rent growth of the last 50 years. And in almost all of those 10 years, rent inflation, uh, rent growth was higher than inflation. So if you're an inflationista, you should definitely be buying apartments. I showed you this graph before, so I won't go through it again. But remember this, there's about 18 million American families that can never catch up with buying a home. America is now a renter nation. So it's time for you to profit from the buy. This is a time to be aggressive. This is because you have a window of opportunity in multifamily, uh, not in single family because pri prices haven't gone down. Multifamily, obviously you're seeing these big discounts, 21, 22, 26, 28%. And so we think that there's a window of opportunity until the end of next year. And I definitely believe in what this man says. Warren Buffett, you've heard this quote before. Be fearful when others are greedy. Be greedy when others are fearful. Right now, I'm greedy because everyone else is fearful. So that's our presentation. Hope you enjoyed the four um, trends. And I'll throw Mission 10K back up on the screen for you to read about it. And I'll take your questions. Perfect. Hey, guys, uh, let... Let Neil know what you think. I see a bunch of emojis already, but uh, thank you. I think you really brought it today, but I, I hope you could see all those. But you're getting a lot of thumbs up, a lot of hearts. I see them, and uh, I, I can just reiterate. So we do a lot of work with with some of the larger syndicators, including uh, Raymond James. Does huge raises. We did the Rio All Suites Casino down here in Vegas. We did mm -hmm. 480 million. Same group is now raising over a billion dollars to do apartments. Everything you just said is what they're saying, which is what's going to kill people is those that are dependent on the debt. And they're going to get reset right out of existence, which means everything's on sale. Everything's on sale. And actually, the sales really start in Q1, Q2 next year. So I, I would say everything's going to be on sale. They're actually saying we're going to raise but we're not jumping at the opportunities yet because there isn't enough blood on the streets. It's, right. yep. it's going to get worse. And so uh, yeah, you're going to see that. So when they, when they came to us, they're like, we're going to raise a billion dollars. And we're like, yeah, really? Did I hear that right? Yeah. A be, billion. Yeah. <laughs> and, then, and they're like, yeah, we, because they, they know that there's opportunities they're tracking a bunch. So, um, but if you could buy it cash, it's cash flow, you know, and that's the whole thing. These things are cash flow positive and there's always a market for it. It's just a lot of people jumped in with the leverage and until those interest rates come down, which they may never go back to where they were, um, there's going to be opportunity for those of us that are cash buyers. Right. So, uh, anyway, yeah. let's go to some of these questions. Yeah. Low lying fruit. I don't see anything about rent. Well, I, I think I had a slide about rents. Um, and my feedback is rents will go back up in 2025 as we stop, we've stopped building multifamily in the United States. That affects nobody today, by the way. But in 2025, when these buildings were supposed to deliver, when they don't deliver, we're going to have a shortage. 
So I expect very strong rent growth in second half of 2025 and, and first half of 2026. I wouldn't be surprised if we see 10%. And let's, let, let's have a word about rent growth. We're not rent growth is not negative. So let's say that right. it, let's say that a seven 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 is at thirty five thousand feet. Yep. Next year it's not going down to thirty thousand feet. It's still at thirty five thousand. It's going up to about thirty six thousand feet. It's not coming out of the sky. It's just not growing. Like it went from twenty thousand feet to thirty thousand feet in a real short period of time. Is what it is. And now it's kind of yeah leveling right. down we're not seeing and one, one other data point there right so the last 12 months toby the rent growth in the united states has been zero right mm -hmm. but should you really look at one year especially a year this unusual why don't you look at two years so why don't you look at 24 months well in 24 months it's 15 plus zero and that's a, a total of 15 percent divide that by two years that's seven and a half percent a year the historical average two and a half so it's 3x the historical average if you look at a two-year time frame. Why would you want to look at a one-year time frame? Who wants to be a landlord for a year? Nobody. <laughs> yeah. uh, hey, guys, we're going to send out – everybody's asking for your slides. I'm not going to give them – Of course. Anything. You want to give them slides. We'll give you the recording, but – Yes. Yeah. They, I think the, the recording is, is what you guys hand out, so it, you, you'll have a recording. Slides are all there in the recording, guys. What will happen to the single-family – residence prices in the downtown areas somebody's asking i i expect to see reductions i don't expect to see um massive reductions but i expect to see reductions i think that those prices were based on the offices they were based on the malls they were based it's an ecosystem and when that ecosystem starts to see large reductions you're going to see reduction in prices again i i don't expect uh, blood in the water but i wouldn't be surprised if for the next five years downtown prices go down five six seven percent every year Somebody's asking, so your 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 mission 10K, I know that that's a labor of love for you. And I yes. totally get it. And I'm on board 100%. I, here, here's my two seconds. We need as individuals to become landlords because Blackstone owes its duty to its shareholders. It cannot be human. It cannot be compassionate to its tenants. If there's somebody who's 80 years old and their tenant... They're not allowed to say, hey, we're going to be really kind to you or a disabled vet. They have to do what's best for their shareholder in return or they get sued. Yep. So we need more of us investing. And so I see what you're doing 100%. We've been looking at all the different ways to build cheaper. It's 200 bucks a foot to build most places. So how do we get it down to the, you know, the 100? You've done amazing the vertical construction cost of keeping it low. That's the only way we're going to do it. We're going to have to keep innovating. There's lots of people coming up with new materials. America is a land of great opportunity because we're very innovative. And I know a lot of folks are trying to innovate their way uh, into to lower housing costs. We will find a way. There's all sorts of stuff that's coming out from blocks to 3D printing to all these things. Uh, we will find a way. But what's nice is there are markets today in the United States that exist that are very robust. Like I showed you, Fayetteville slash Rogers. Yeah. Construction cost 138, Toby, not 200, 138. Hard bids. So here's the questions. Is that a project that's eligible for 1031 exchange? Somebody's asked. And then also are these credit investors. Yeah, 1031 exchange and self directed IRAs, 401ks are very common use for our projects. So people 1031 into them. It, the, just be aware that you have to come in a little bit earlier as a 1031 investor because you're technically not an investor, you're an owner. In, in case of a 1031. So you have to basically form a tenant in common. It's very hard to form form a tick towards the end of the raise. So you basically have to work with us. It takes a while uh, for, for us to put you into an opportunity. Also a bank wants your information. You're not on the hook for the loan, I am, but but they still want to know because you're an owner on that, on that land. Yeah, somebody's saying, do you use leverage or are you all cash? Well, if I was using all cash, I would be out of business. I simply do not know of a way to make more than six or seven percent using all cash. And I haven't found any investors that are willing to take that return. Yeah. Now, as an individual, I could say that's actually where I start at is six percent. People mm -hmm. always say, but but you're not making enough money. And I'm like, well, I built up enough, right? Mm -hmm. At some point, I'm just not a big dead guy. Um that said, 
using other people's money is how you lever up and how you get greater returns and cash on cash returns are you are not good when you're buying cash. I get that. I get that. I get yeah. that. I'm never one to sit there. I bring syndication opportunities to folks all the time. If we bet them out, then they're not using too much debt. I just get freaky when it's like, if I see 70% debt, I start getting heart palpitations and freaking well, out. Well, Toby, you'll be, you'll be, for right now, of course, you can get high debt, right? So the banks are not levering it up more than 60% anyway. So the mm -hmm. banks are doing a good job of keeping us from, you know, over leveraging. But would you, you know, Toby, I think you'd, you'd be interested in learning a ton of my properties also have no debt. So yeah. in my personal life, I do, you know, I, I want that peace of mind. But professionally speaking, I can only do what is possible. I live in the realm of the possible. Yep. You have to you have to return higher when you're doing a syndication. I get that. Yep. I just when I when I when it's a little me peon, I, I, I look at myself as a peon investor and I'm and I'm and I'm looking for more peons like me. We like we have to go out there and we have to buy properties and and do the best things we can. And then it's data like this that allows us to avoid mistakes. And that's all we're trying to do is minimize the likelihood of mistake, put all the odds in our favor. Uh, speaking of those, you had a lot of comments about downtowns. And I think that you hit a nerve with some folks because I had all these things like, how would you define a downtown? When you say five miles from downtown, how do you do that? Like there's people sure. that are scared now. I think you freak some people out. So I, yeah, I, the, the honestly, the five mile radius thing wasn't the best thing to say. You know, you can actually define downtowns uh, by going to Google and saying downtown San Francisco, downtown Los Angeles. It actually gives you a map. I would say stay outside of that. Uh, somebody's asking about storage units. That That's not really your area, right? Do you ever dive into the storage? It seems to be a robust area. I invest in it as a limited partner, so I have limited understanding of it. Uh, I think that it's it's a robust market. We haven't seen significant price declines. I'm I'm not a professional. I'm an investor in several syndications. We work with uh, Spartan and Ryan Gibson and his team, and the worst yeah. I've seen them return is twenty six percent over a two year yeah. period. So, um, and they're data driven too, like total. He's an airline pilot who went into storage. I love the fact that. Yeah, he's a friend. Um, we I, I appear on their podcast several times a year. They love, they're, they're, they get very geeky and nerdy with us. Hey, we, we, we love geeking out and they've done great. I haven't, I haven't had a loss on any of their deals for any of my clients. And you know how I know? Because I do your flipping taxes and I can see their K-1s and I know. What the, <laughs> I, every time somebody says I make money on all my deals, I'm like, uh, hut up or shut up. Let's see their... Uh, because I've gotten killed on stuff. It's like, it's all about averages. Um, somebody says, there's two people that were at, like really chiming in on Airbnb. They seem really interested in that. Do you have any comments on the short-term rental market? Yeah, in general, the SDR market is definitely in trouble. Not yet. I, I you know, keep in mind that the uh, rents in that market have increased a lot because of uh, revenge travel post COVID. I think that there are more portions of that market that are too expensive and we'll say they may have the same debt issues, but not to the level that multifamily has because so many of those had fixed debt. So as long as people finance them using a lower level debt in the 2021 timeframe, I think they're still gonna be able to write it uh, out. So it's it's less than the commercial issue, less than the multifamily issue, but there's still some issues there because I think people overpaid for some of these buildings. So it's it's really about when you bought it, what kind of debt do you have on it? Yeah, I just did a uh, podcast with Jimmy Lynn over there at uh, Air, Air DNA, and he's the chief economist. And I think his last name is it's Jamie. I, I just know him as Jamie, but he's the chief economist over there. And um, yeah, it's fascinating when you look at the numbers of Airbnb. It's definitely market driven, and you could run, and their tool allows you to pick or pick much like yep. what you're doing is we're trying to say, Oh, we, we use their tool all the time when we do that kind of investing. You're looking at the general area, trying to give yourself the best option, which ones are too overheated, which ones are on the way down, which ones aren't, don't have the growth, which ones can't support. Um, and you, and again, it's, it's, it's always, the numbers don't lie. People do. Yep. Numbers yep. Don't. Um, so we already hit the 1031 exchange. There's two or three of those, actually. A lot of folks are interested in your, your project 10 or mission 10K. 
with with that. And uh, we're a little bit over, so I'm going to look for one last. Somebody was really worried. They have their money tied up in a townhome construction project in Texas, and now they're worried that it's going to default based off what you just said. I like. Are townhomes all right? Are we safe or are we worried about debt in all projects? No, well, I hope it works out. I don't know anything about your project, but it's there are projects that are challenged. What I've done with my projects in Texas, just you know, as a disclaimer, I've actually stopped construction. I went back to my investors and said, guys, I don't want to take on 11% debt. Can I please just wait for a year or a year and a half? They said, fine, Neil. That's what most people are doing. That's it. Like, there's still a bunch of questions out there, guys. I'm sorry, but there's there, there's a there's so many. Not all particularly related to this. I think there's some anxiety, and folks want some reassurance. Uh, I'll just say this: you put your QR code. We sent out the code repeatedly. Mm -hmm. uh, Jen, maybe you could, or 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 somebody could send out the link again, so people can get your uh, the location magic, and also that just gets them your contact information too. So if they want to make sure everybody's sending it out, looks like Jane and Jennifer and everybody's shooting it out. If somebody wants to be on your podcast or on your uh, list for January, when you update the information, when you come out with a new location magic, is this a way that they can do it? Are they, are they able to use one of these links? And I think and if you, if you filled out the form that was tied to this, yes, you are now on the list and we send out an invite right around Jan 20th saying, Hey, it's time for location magic again. All right, last poll of the day, and then I'll let you go, Neil. If you guys could give me a thumbs up or a heart, if you'd like to have Neil come back and do this again, beginning of next year. Oh, looks like uh, looks like we're going to have to extend Ooh. an invite to you and have you come back out. And I'm going to screenshot that, Toby. I'm telling you. It's a wave. I like that. It's a wave of hearts. And yeah, no, you, Neil, you always do a great job. I just appreciate you coming on and sharing information. Thank you. No Thank BS, you. no spin. It's just straightforward. It just help you guys make better decisions because gosh knows if you turn on the cable TV, you're going to tear your hair out and run out. You're like, turn you're that damn thing off. It's messing with your head. Yep. 100%. All right, guys. Good luck out there. Thanks, Neil. Really Thank you so much. Guys. Great to be with you again, Toby. Thanks. Until next time.